the noise of gunfire rose from all over the center of Peking. We're in for march. Why? 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 Welcome to the CCP Reality Check, special series, Series 2, Episode 2. I'm your host, David Starwatcher, a new Chinese who is taking down the evil CCP. For tonight's episode, we are going to look into a remote conference service. And of course, we have already written that on our title, and it's called Zoom. So I know at this point, you may start to wonder what happened to Zoom and why could Zoom zoom in to spy on us? What kinds of threats it could bring to us? To answer these questions, we will now start today's episode on Zoom to see what risks and threats are hidden beneath their playing side. So what is Zoom? Zoom itself, in its essence, is a remote conference service based on cloud computing, and of course, with software and mobile applications that are for conference video calls, instant messaging, and of course, business communications. It is established in Delaware on April 21st, 2011, headquartered in San Jose, California. So people may start thinking, oh, that is an American company, but its growth sped up from 2019 to 2021 during the COVID pandemic. So that is a point we have to take note of. So you may wonder, what is the impact of Zoom on our lives? To look into this, we've found all the numbers you may need to take a look or you may be interested in. Zoom is currently used by institutional users, 500,000 enterprises, and that number boost up to 504,900 in 2023. Among these users, 70% of these enterprises are in Fortune 100, 50% are in the list of Fortune Global 500, 85% of the are in the Forbes Cloud 100. So you may ask what is Forbes Cloud? Forbes Cloud means the cloud computing or cloud-based internet service enterprises that made that are so large that they made it into the Forbes Cloud 100 lists. But according to Mr. Mao's course live stream on June the 27th, 2021, there's also a large number, a large portion of institutes. It includes court systems, universities, educational institutions, and 70% of government departments around the world and 30% of militaries around the world. These institutions also used Zoom for conferences. 
Just an additional note, Bridgewater, a found with CCP connections, also used Zoom for their own meetings. So that means, what does this tell us? It tells us that that means there is a significant reliance on Zoom as a means to conduct essential meetings. And a number of times, these meetings would include confidential information. But this confidential information, in turn, will be transferred and recorded by Zoom. We'll explain on that point later. So right now, let's look at how many individual users does Zoom have. Zoom has about 300 million daily active users, according to its official blog, blog posts. But when we are checking and doing our research on this topic, we find out that Zoom changed the term daily active users into meeting participants. Strange, but let's move on to see the Zoom's financial situation. From what we see here, Zoom is a very huge, with a very huge volume enterprise. It has an income of 4.09 billion in 2022 and a value of 20.81 billion in 2023. So you may start thinking to yourself, we are using Zoom daily and Zoom is an American company. What can it go wrong? Well, please don't come up with that conclusion too early because after because we are going to lead you to take a look what can be go wrong, what can Zoom can go is very wrong. So let's move on to see for Zoom, are there anything that sounds risky to us, the users? The answer is yes. The first one will be coming from Felix Zeller from VMRay, a certain independent media. That person finds out that a there is a pre-install script that was found and used in a Zoom Mac OS version. So for what, did, what does that mean? Pre-install script allows installation of programs without users' final authorization. And it means if Zoom is going to install something into your computer, it doesn't need to ask you and it, it does not even need to notify you what is happening. Instead, it will just simply download all those things into the computer and all those programs will be, uh, for example, um, well, opening up your microphones, your cameras in the background when you are asleep and doing all sorts of things to spy on you. So it's, and also according to our research and to the, according to this person, he said that there's only a, mal that only a malicious program of Mac OS would do so. This is not only this is not the only example of its security risks. FBI also issued a warning on Zoom, and we will show that later. The third one, which is going to take a lot of our attention, is the result from Citizen Lab of the University of Toronto back in 2020. It found out that Zoom actually used very fragile encryption, not the AES-256 it claimed, but a very easy to hack AES-128. Well, we cannot go too far in these technical terms, but we just know AES-128 is very easy to get hacked. Also, Zoom would reroute its communication data back to Beijing. Beijing is inside the communist China. Mm, that adds up a lot of complication, and that is something we have to very pay attention to. To explain that those points a little bit further, the Citizen Lab further noticed that in the AE, when it says easy to hack encryption, it is referring to an electronic codebook, which means basically you don't have, you have no encryption or very little encryption used to protect the data. And we wrap back to Beijing because there are Zoom servers in the communist China, and the key to decrypting the encryption development was actually in the communist China under the CCP regime. Moreover, Zoom's application development is in the communist China and the applications design in communist China has to obey the CCP's order. Well, just at an additional note, a company in the communist China must escrow its keys to the CCP's institution. What does it mean by escrow? It means to hand over the key to an encryption that means to protect your data 
into the hands of CCP's institution. And bear in mind the CCP institutions has nearly, I would say virtually, of course, an unlimited power on what it can do that once it has the keys to the data. So up to this point, let us take a look at the FBI's warning on Zoom security risks. So FBI actually issued a warning back in 2020, warning about the hijacking during the COVID-19 pandemic. That means during this period, Zoom has been hijacked that with the means of a lot of interruptions of different video live streams that are not supposed to be in here or are being in interrupted by certain participants that are not on the list. That means the data to the users, between users, are not being protected well. But that is not the biggest problem. The biggest problem we are going to take a look right away is, continue, that Zoom is a part of CCP's enslavement agenda. According to one of the Mr. Mao's scores earlier live stream back in back on June the 16th, 2021, Zoom was getting a huge amount of money from the CCP and Zoom's development plan, making it mainstream, i.e. over 50% of market share and making people reliant on Zoom in the Western country a part. It becomes, I mean, that kind of development plan is a part of the CCP's agenda. More, even wor more worrying to all the users of Zoom, and if anyone's using Zoom should really realize that the Zoom's development plan of occupying over 50% of market share and making people in the West reliant on Zoom was approved by CCP's General Secretary Xi, Xi Jinping, former CCP's Vice President Wang Qishan, and the CCP's Minister of Public Security, Zhao Kezhi. So what is the significance of this? The significance of this is that in order to get your development plan to be approved by the, these high level officers, that person either has to get a very deep connection with the regime or even the development itself is being first considered a part of the CCP's agenda to enslave the world. Well, people might be start thinking, and that's a, that is really, really horrifying. So you may really start ask, asking this question in your mind, that there are so many risks and it is a tool of the CCP. So now we want to know who founded Zoom and what is the Zoom's founder's background. We are going to look into this part right away. The founder of Zoom is called Eric Yuan. So Eric Yuan was born in Tai'an, Shandong province in the communist China back in 1970s. His father was openly, well, recorded as working as a geoengineer. So Eric obtained his graduate degree from a university ranked outside of the top 100 university in the communist China. And when Yuan was in the United States in 1997, he spoke very little English. At the same year, Yuan joined WebEx, which is later acquired by Cisco. And Yuan raised his status very quickly through human relationships and coding techniques. So now, after you looking into this background, you may start having a first formed up an impression that hmm, it may sound very impressive, but there are a lot of problems. There are some questions we have to consider, of course. So the biggest problem is Yuan has no foreign, has does not have a studying abroad or studying in the foreign countries experience. And we already know from the openly available information that he has very little English skills. So what could make him this successful, especially in the 90s? Moreover, Eric Yuan's undergrad institute was the fact, I mean, please, please bear in mind, Eric Yuan was not graduated from an undergrad institute that is within the top 100 rank within the communist China, should raise a big 
alarm because that most of I mean, if anyone has any experiences with the students who are studying abroad, mostly those students are from in the very early, very, very early days, are at least from the schools that are listed in the Project 985 and Project 211. I know you may wonder, David, what is that? But you just understand them as the uh, priority universities under the CCP rule. So what is the significance of those? That means that those graduates from those two, the, the, from the schools of those two projects have are much more competitive within the communist China's uh, job market. But so with all these things coming into mind, you may start to wonder saying, so what, why on, what, what, why, what on earth happened to Eric Yuan? Why can't he do this? People are trying to, and all the media reports trying to shape our shape as if it is such a, it is so much a miracle or something else, but no. Because looking at the last point, the one last point we've mentioned, his race of status is based on human relationships and his coding techniques. So what is that human relationship? We don't know. So after hearing all of these, do they sound shady to you? Remember, even in a society like the United States, hard, I mean, in the Silicon Valley, in the nearly the end of 90s, that anyone with little English skills could work in one of those companies. And can, so you may wonder, can there be any other power that assisted Eric's survival and development of Zoom? We will explore this further by looking into what are the Zoom's connections to the CCP. Because that sounds like a plausible possibility of how Zoom can get to its status and how Eric Yuan can climb up to this kind of status. So in order to answer the question, what are the Zoom's connections to the CCP, we are going to look into who are the investors of Zoom. We already saw, if you look into Zoom's uh, investors in the public available channels, you will see them including ARK Investments, BlackRock, Vanguard, JP Morgan, and several other big names. But we don't have time to look into all of them. So we just find out three of the names that stood out the most. Among these lists or seas of investors, these three are BlackRock Inc., Sequoia Capital, and Vanguard. BlackRock, Vanguard, Sequoia Capital. Hmm, these three names Sounds very familiar. If any of our viewers have followed our previous live stream talks about the chat GPT and also our previous live stream talk about Pacific Alliance Group. But do not worry, and we will explore a bit further on this. So what is the connection of Sequoia? Let's continue to see what is the connection of Sequoia, BlackRock and Vanguard Group with the CCP regime. We will start with Sequoia Group. Sequoia Group is officially based in the United States and of course it has a branch in the Communist China. But bear in mind, bear in mind, bear in mind that the branch in the Communist China and the, and the headquarters in the United States are both owned by Nao Shen. There's actually a list of the CCP of affiliated entities that Sequoia Capital, China, and the Sequoia Capital invested in. Well, this is a list of them. We have listed that for you, and these entities are Alibaba, DJI, the one that makes drones and are now under US sanctions, BGI Group, and of course, Zoom. So, Bain, which is just at a side note, BGI Group was sanctioned due to its ties to the CCP's PRA. So you may wonder what is the BGI Group? BGI Group is in Chinese called Hua Da Jin. It's basically a biotechnological company that collects DNA information. But it is very dangerous because not only saying it collects DNA, it also collects DNA information from the Americans. And of course, BGI does have the tie 
to the CCP API. So the th thing is, it doesn't stop here. It's, there's also one important point to point out that Niall Shen has close ties to the CCP's office show and Emperor Xi. Just like Weijin Shang, we mentioned, we've mentioned in the previous live stream, he was also, he is also a high level spy. So we've finished the part of Sequoia Capital. What about BlackRock? BlackRock Inc. Well, BlackRock is the world's largest assets management firm. Don't confuse it with Blackstone. We are talking about BlackRock. So BlackRock, there's a news comes out in 2021 saying that BlackRock would set up a mutual fund in the Communist China. So what is a mutual fund? A mutual fund is a financial vehicle that pulls assets from shareholders to invest in securities like stocks, bonds, money market instruments, and other assets, which basically, to speak it shortly, saying it, what it does is basically make uh, collecting people's money into a pool and invest them into different assets. That's what mutual funds do. So basically it means that it gathers funds from different individuals to invest in some other companies. But the, the significance part of this is that this mutual fund is first of its kind in the communist China. And it's quite impossible to do so without connections and approvals from the CCP regime. So in order to gain connection approval, the companies has to be connected with the CCP's kleptocratic families, sometimes even belong by them and comply with the CCP's demands. Moreover, just a side note, the finance field inside the Communist China is under tight control of the CCP. In order to get in there, as I said, you either have connection to the CCP's kleptocratic family or your entity has to be affiliated with them. So it may look open to a lot of people, but these there are some hidden details that are hidden very deep and very hard for people to find out. So let's look at the last one, which is called Vanguard. Vanguard is an investment management firm and has $7 trillion under its management at this time. It is the main investor of a Pfizer, Sinovac, and Sinopharm COVID vaccines. But according to Mr. Miles Gross earlier live stream, Vanguard has a close relationship with the CCP's kleptocrats, CDH Investments, which is another CCP affiliated investment firm. And Vanguard is also controlled by other investments of Sinopharm. And Sinopharm is a CCP affiliated entity. No, not only that, we also have to add a side note that Pfizer is controlled by Fusion. And Fusion, Sinovac, and Sinopharm are all entities under the CCP's control. So an entity like Sinopharm is in the hands of the CCP in that regard. So up to this point, who really owns Vanguard? Though it is an American firm, with all those facts, the answers would be very clear to us right now. So you may be wondering, besides the Sequoia Capital and BlackRock, do you think it are there any other proof of Zoom's ties to the CCP? Yes, there are. And there's a very big one. Zoom shut down a meeting commemorating Tiananmen Square, Square's massacre back in June the 4th, 2020. It also shuts down Mr. Mao's Gore's meeting in the past. Both are under the CCP's order. So let's take a look at the screenshot of the DOJ's press release on this event. The event of shutting down Tiananmen Square massacre commemoration back in 2020. Let's continue to take a look. Uh, let's get a full screen to let our view viewers have a full view on what is happening. So we see that here it says company one, company one here equals to Zoom. And basically what it says, you may find it very surprisingly, it only says that an employee of Zoom is shutting down the meeting under the order of the CCP. But you may want to ask me, David, are, are you saying, aren't you saying this is the Zoom's, uh, the Zoom's thing? So what happened? So we have some, I actually find out several points that is worth noticing. One, how an employee had the ability to execute an order from the CCP single-handedly, especially for a company like Zoom with a very, with a billion, trillion, even a billion dollar level income and trillion dollar value in this year. 
How come an employee had an ability to single-handedly execute this? Could it really be possible without a company's permission? Think. Zoom, the second part will be Zoom as an American company. For what reason could the CCP demand Zoom to do so? Isn't there any need for Zoom to comply with American laws to protect everyone's rights to free speech? Moreover, another question would be, Zoom has taken several Chinese employees from Cisco. Were these Chinese later forced to do evil under duress and pressure from the CCP regime? Moreover, the reason why there are employees deep in the communist China, I mean, that's the last one, it's a side note, it's not because of how cheap the labor is, but because, as Mr. Mao Score mentioned in, the, or in his earlier live stream, a part of Zoom's strategy set up, this is actually a part of Zoom's strategy set up by the CCP. If those employees refuse to do so in the Communist China, they will be harmed. And you know how serious the, the consequences are facing them. So now, let's take a pause and breathe. You may start asking yourself a question, David, this sounds very dangerous. So are there any actions taken? Are there any actions taken known to the public? Yes, there are. So let's take a look at some of them. In April 2020, some of the government departments and major enterprises banned Zoom. These enterprises are the US. Oh, I'm sorry, it's not enterprises, but government departments and enterprises are the US Senate, the Auswärtige Amt, which translated as Federal Foreign Office of Germany, the Australian Defence Force, all three are government departments. You also have three major enterprises. Uh, there's a lot of them that banned the use of Zoom. So I only picked out three of them that stood out the most. One is Tesla, one is Google, and another one is SpaceX. In addition, the Indian government banned the use of Zoom in April 2020. Not only that, in 2021, DOJ wrote a letter to the FCC asking FCC to stop Zoom's acquisition of an American cloud service company called Five Nine. So you may wonder, why would DOJ wrote a, wrote a letter to FCC on this? The reason is national security concerns. Let's move on to take a look at a screenshot uh, director, would you please pl display the entire thing in the full screen? In the full screen, so let our audiences take a clear look, a clear look on this. So basically, in here, in here, we will see this. It says, well, very clearly, it. Um, sorry about. It says application poses a risk to the national security and or law enforcement interest. It, so that you, you're looking into the red circled part, it's clearly written here that Zoom has posed national security risks and the legal risks to the United States. So you may think, so you may start thinking, mm, David, but this is just a free, free app, a free service for everyone to use, or it has subscriptions. But let me ask one question. Do you think DOJ were going to you're going to raise this kind of concern without any of the proof or any of the signals. Side note, when we are doing research, we found out that this application of acquiring an American firm is actually reached an end and stopped. It stopped and it does not continue. Why would it stop if Zoom is really that innocent? without any connections to the CCP. Think. So you may start wondering, David, what we can do for now? I mean, this is very dangerous, but uh, we have to use them every day. And, and, and sometimes even our educational institutions are asking us to do. I hear you, I know. So let's move on. Yeah, so let's move to the last part. Let's see what we can do. Of course, I have to say that we cannot give too much of the help, but we can give some suggestions that might be useful. 
let's look at some suggestions that we that we may be able to help the viewers. So the first one will be actively searching for alternatives. There are actually a lot of alternatives to Zoom if you're looking for a reliable and free remote conference service, or for example, Slack. Uh, again, just just an announcement. I have not received any of the pay promotion from them, so I'm just giving these suggestions from my personal uh, personal experience and some of the things that I that I know. First thing is we're actively searching for alternatives such as Slack, uh, Web, uh, Cisco WebEx, Skype, or several other other services. Indeed, well, in, and also in fact, there are some services much better than Zoom and much safer than than Zoom to use. Also, another thing that our viewers can do in the free in the free countries is to urge our Congress, U.S. Congress representatives, state, I mean, state Senate or House representatives, or even uh, parliament members in the U.K. or in other European countries, and even a DA members in Japan, to investigate into Zoom. So these are the things that we can do for now. So uh, that is the end of today's episode. But before we end, let us take a look to see if there's any any people are looking for or any people have any questions in our chat so okay uh, i was saying thank you mickey for joining our chat and also thank you my name is blue for joining our chat and thank you everyone for watching today's episode and we hope that this information could help others and it will help a lot of people to raise the awareness of the CCP's infiltration. I'm your host, David Stolacher, and I'm a new Chinese who is taking down the evil CCP. And I'll be seeing you next time in the live stream. Have a good night.